My name is Rachel Rupp. I'm uh, from Inhaye in Toulouse. Uh, so I'm the coordinator of the, of the project. So it's my great pleasure to welcome you and to introduce this uh, course uh, with a first talk on uh, disease resistance and resilience in small ruminants. So the objective is to give you an overview, a very general overview of concepts, but also give you the key points uh, of traits, recording, and uh, genetic uh, control of these traits in small ruminants. And uh, the examples will be mainly uh, will mainly come from the smarter projects. Um, the scope of the talk: uh, we are going to talk about genetic purpose, not about vaccine risk factors, but very uh, concentrated on the possibilities for selection, focusing on small ruminants. And because lack of time, I, I decided not to talk about welfare and behavior. But of course, the, the, these uh, aspects could have been. Um, including in the, in the topic as well. We can state that the selection programs on production traits have been very efficient uh, since the 60s. And this is illustrated from a figure uh, that comes from the publication of, of Luis Brito in 2021, where you have the average milk production per year from the 60s to the year 2020 and you see almost a doubling of the milk production in various uh, dairy cattle breed. And this is the case in the most productive uh, small ruminant breeds as well. So there are new challenges now, especially because we think that there is a possible adverse effect uh, of these selection and production on functional traits. And so there's an opportunity to tackle this and to lower the production costs to limit the use of drugs, uh, to consider animal welfare. OK, but the major challenge for livestock breeding, of course, it's climate change, adapting to climate change. Small ruminants will have to face heat stress, extreme, uh, extreme climate conditions, drought, um, nutritional uh, um, difficulties to have a, a good quality uh, of, of feed. But also, if we want to lower the impact uh, of the livestock on uh, the environment, we should uh, focus on more uh, resilient uh, breeding systems, uh, relying on extensive systems and uh, with low uh, inputs. So that's uh, for all that reason, we really need to consider alternative traits to production, such as disease resistance and resilience. There are different ways of considering these disease resistance and resilience traits. And um, the different aspects I list here will figure out the outline of my presentation. First, we can consider resistance to identify diseases. But if we don't know what are the diseases in your system, then you can consider more global traits, such as global health or adaptation capacities. Furthermore, you can consider resilience, but there's not a very um, a high consensus of how to define resilience. But uh, in the last decade, we uh, as uh, animal scientists consider that resilience should be defined as a dynamic response to stress. And this will be the third point of my presentation. And at last, to finish the presentation, I wanted to give you some uh, important points you have to keep in mind when you go from the discovery, having your traits uh, you want to select, and going to the application. So first, start with disease resistance. But which diseases in small ruminants? And uh, here I have uh, put a table <coughs> from the paper from Davis, uh, published in 2009. This is a very good paper that gives you for different uh, species, here the sheep, which are the most important diseases. And how they did that, they scored the diseases according to different aspects, the industry concern, the economic impacts, public concern, zoonetic uh, potential, are there animal welfare issues, are there uh, international trade uh, issues, and so they um, uh, calculated a score, and the higher, the more important the disease. And after, on another, on another point of view, they scored the disease uh, according to 
the, the knowledge of genetic variation. Is there a possibility for selection for these traits? And from that uh, study, uh, they highlighted that clearly in small ruminants, you have the same table in goats, the main uh, diseases are mastitis in both dairy and meat small ruminants, gastrointestinal parasites, foot rots, and maidy visna. So for these main diseases in small ruminants, here are a few key figures that will be important for the rest of my presentation. You may uh, already know, but as a reminder, Mastitis is other inflammation, mainly caused by infection with staphylococci, bacteria. It causes lots of milk due to subclinical infection. There are very few clinical cases in a small ruminants when compared to dairy cattle. Then for gastrointestinal parasites, these are infestations with nematodes. It's uh, the main constraint for grazing ruminants. It causes lower production and the uh, important uh, fact is that there are increasing resistance to the drugs, to the anti due to extensive use. Foot rot is an infection of the hooves, of the feet of the animals, with the bacteria Dicylobacter nodosus. It causes, it's the major cause of lameness in sheep. It's highly contagious. It causes pain and welfare issues. Medivisna and caprine arthritis and encephalitis are the two sides of the same disease in sheep for medivisna and in goat for CAEV. These are general infections with lentiviruses. These are retroviruses uh, of the family of um, HIV, for instance, in a human. It's a progressive disease and uh, it can cause uh, very large production loss and the clinical signs such as arthritis or mastitis. So we say that um, resistance to infectious disease is a complex trait because you have uh, these different aspects. First, the host, so physiological state of the host and the genetic, which is of interest to us today. The environmental part, with, uh, as for um, uh, every other um, trait. But in this trait, you have a third pillar, which is very important, which is the pathogen, because it influences the expression of the trait. Which pathogen you have, bacteria, virus, parasites, uh, which strain is it more or less virulent, and is it present or not present? So a little bit of terminology. So if you want to define resistance or susceptibility, then the first point is to have exposure to the pathogen. Then if you have no infection, then you would call that true resistance. If you have infection, but quick self-cure, then this is resistance as well, but not the same mechanisms are involved. If you have infection and no clinical signs and no impact on production, then you would call that resilience. If you have infection and no clinical signs, that would be tolerance. And finally, if you have infection and then chronic disease and clinical signs uh, potentially going to death, this is susceptibility. So why is this uh, important? Because the different traits the, do not uh, impact the animal in the same way, especially for uh, production. And in the case of resilience and tolerance, for instance, you can have healthy carriers that's to say you think the animal is resistance, resistant, but in fact it carries the pathogen and it can disseminate it. Now you have these different aspects of resilience you want to uh, address. You can do that in natural infection conditions uh, using field studies or experimental farms. So if you do so, you can achieve high numbers of animals, which is uh, uh, um, important when you want to do some genetics after. But the question is then, are your animal exposed or not exposed? Because in a flock where uh, you don't know that, you don't know if your animals are all resistant or just not exposed to the pathogen. So in, in the case of mastitis, it's not really a problem because we suppose that mastitis, uh, staphylococci are everywhere. So that's uh, quite easy to study mastitis uh, on field. However, for foot rot, for instance, or for lentiviruses, you have to make sure to some extent that your virus or your pathogen is circulating in, in, uh, in the environment. 
So in some cases, it can be um, more relevant to rely on experimental challenges or model challenges. So you can control the presence of the pathogen, the strain, the quantity, the time. But of course, this approach uh, increases the workload, uh, the costs, and uh, you can in general achieve smaller number of animals. But it's widely used for gastrointestinal parasites, for instance. And here in this figure, you have uh, an example of an experimental design for RAM experimental inf infection. So you can see two periods of infection of four weeks and uh, between the two uh, recovery period of two weeks and very precise time points where to measure um, some trait related to resilience. And you can apply this protocol in uh, several um, uh, locations and uh, across years, so you can really compare the resistance of the animals over a period of time or over uh, the different locations. So now you know in which condition you want to evaluate your disease resistance traits in uh, natural infections or experimental challenge. So now what to measure? First, you can um, use some direct measures that are related to the diagnosis of the disease. And you have a lot of uh, batch of uh, measures linked to clinical signs, death, uh, autopsy. And uh, to highlight this, to illustrate this, I have put several figures that uh, are from Smarter. Here's the FAMACHA test. This test um, uh, measures the anemia of the animal. So in fact, you look at the color of the mucosa of the eye and you compare it to a panel of color. And if it's pink, uh, see, uh, or white, then it signs an anemia. And you can uh, suppose that there is gastrointestinal parasites in, in the animal, but it's uh, very easy to implement, but it's not specific. There are other diseases that causes anemia. Here is a, an illustration of the DAC scoring, which is in fact uh, looking at the fecal soiling of the rear of the animal, and this is done to uh, correlate to, to gastrointestinal parasites. Here is an example of the hoof scoring uh, for, for the di diagnosis of uh, foot rots. And this is a five grade scoring. Uh, for example, in grade one, you have very clean, unaffected hooves, feet. In the score two, you have uh, in, intra uh, here uh, uh, a slight a mild uh, inflammation. Here you have necrosis and here, I don't know if you see very well, but you have an underrunning of the soul. So you can score the presence of uh, food rot of the bacteria Dicelobacter nodosus. In the last um, image, I wanted to illustrate uh, the possibility of uh, measuring body temperature using uh, boluses. There's a a word uh, missing here. These boluses, these small boluses, you can make the animals swallow, swallow them. They, they will locate after in the pre-stomach and they are equipped with a small battery and they can um, interact with an antenna and send uh, every five minutes an information on the body temperature of the animal. So this is a, a way of recording uh, online uh, very often the health status of the animal. So we have implemented such um, a study in Smarter, but still not have analyzed the data. And on Wednesday evening, you will have these data sets to, uh, to try and uh, see what you can do with that. And I'm uh, really uh, excited about the results you can, uh, you can uh, find uh, with, with that uh, data set. So, okay. Um, we were talking about the clinical science. You can also, if you want to diagnose the, the, the disease, uh, try and identify, quantify the pathogen. You can do that using ELISA tests. Uh, it's usual for detecting uh, CAEV and uh, Medivisna, so the lentiviruses in, uh, in sheep and goats. It's also done for gastrointestinal parasites. For gastrointestinal parasites, it's also very common to count the egg of nematodes in feces. And for mastitis, uh, you usually want to do some milk bacteriology to identify the staphylococci. 
Okay, so these were direct measures. Here, um, a set of indirect measures where, in fact, you predict the disease, but it's not very specific. For instance, you can measure the inflammatory response of the host, and this is done usually uh, for, the, for the, um, predicting mastitis. You use uh, the milk somatic cell count, as these cell counts come from the bloodstream to the mammary gland when there is an infection. And there is another way of uh, um, recording this inflammatory response is using the California mastitis test, which is illustrated here. In fact, what you do is to um, take milk of the two half udders, put the milk in uh, two um, cups, and then you put a reagent, and then it uh, like coagulates and you look at the thickening of the solution, and uh, the more cell counts cell you have in milk, the, the more thick is the preparation, and so you can diagnose very quickly on farm the presence of mastitis. You can also dose the immune response of the host, so do dosing cytokines or immunoglobulins, and uh, if you have really don't have any clue about how to measuring the disease, but you know it has an impact on production, then you can uh, record the production losses. So, okay, uh, so about what about the genetic basis of these disease, uh, different disease traits? In this table, I have uh, listed the most up-to-date uh, studies and estimation. Uh, most come from SMARTER. The, all the, the, the reference in green are from uh, SMARTER. So what do we see? For mastitis, we have heritability for milk somatic cell counts that range from 0.11 to 0.21 in the different uh, sheep and goat, uh, uh, different sheep and, and, and goat breeds. For Cali California mastitis test, it's a little bit lower, lower than 0.10. For clinical cases, it's even lower, 0.04. For gastrointestinal parasite, the most commonly uh, studied um, trait is the fecal egg counts, as we discussed before. The uh, heritabilities range from 0 0.07 to 0 0.29, depending on species and breed. I wanted to highlight that the study from uh, Sebastian Mucha is a meta-analysis, so you have a very a summary of all the, the estimates from the literature. For gastrointestinal parasites, there ha have been estimations for alternative traits, such as number of worms, dagginess, hematocrite, the FAMACHE test, and also the cytokines, antibodies, and these range also between 0.10 and 0.30. Uh, there's a very high value for the anti antibody response. In general, antibody response is a, a very um, um, heritable trait. For food rot, clinical scoring, the heritability was 0.12. And for CAEV, uh, the heritability of the ELISA tests ranged between 0.03 to 0.13. So a general figure of um, these results, um, it was to show you that heritability of these traits related to disease resistance are generally low to moderate, much lower than for meat production, for instance. This doesn't mean that you cannot select. It's, uh, more often, there, are, there is a, a very large genetic variation. But as the environmental variation is very high, then it dilutes the heritability. And that's why you have lower heritability. OK, uh, now there are um, more information coming from the genome-wide association studies, thanks to the availability of uh, of uh, high density um, SNP chips. And uh, to highlight this, I wanted to show you two examples for major gene detected by a genome wide association study um, related to disease resistance. The first one, uh, it's a study from our group. It's a major gene that's associated with mastitis. In, fa in fact, we found from a genome wide association study a very big uh, significant QTL on chromosome 3. Then we performed fine mapping uh, using whole genome sequencing and we found um, a non-synonymous SNP in the SOX2 gene. We then uh, performed a functional test to, to make sure that this was really the, the, the causal mutation and 
indeed, we found a loss of link affinity of the mutated, uh, um, um, mutated uh, protein. So we uh, could state that this mutation was causing a defect of retro control of the inflammation so that the chronic disease sets in. And the mutation was, uh, had a, a, a large effect as it explained 10% of the variance. However, we tried and find this mutation in another population. It was very specific to the Lacron breed. So we, we, we do not have something similar in other breeds. <coughs> so after here, uh, we, have, we, we did some work on, um, on methods how to include this information together with the other uh, phenotypes in the genetic evaluation. OK, the second example is a major gene TMEM154 uh, associated with Medivisna in sheep, so with the lentiviruses disease. This is an American study. They uh, used a large population of exposed sheep, so they uh, went to uh, farms where, the, where they were sure the virus was there. They performed a lot of ELISA tests, so uh, positive or negative to the, to the presence of uh, the lentivirus. From that, they uh, used a subset of the data of 69 case control to be very sure that the animals were exposed, non-exposed, but the, in the very similar conditions. And given that, that they found with a genomoid association study, a very uh, significant QTL on, the, on this gene. TMEM 154. They did some fine mapping and found different variants in this gene that was associated with the, the presence or not of the, of the virus in the animals. So they uh, tried and see if there were other populations carrying these different variants. And that's what they did in the this, in this second publication, in where they uh, explored in 74 ovine breeds the different variants for this resistance. And you can see here is the frequency of the um, ancestral, ancestral form of, of, of the gene, which is more at, at risk. And you see a very large variation of the frequency of this susceptibility, susceptible variation. So there is a, a, a very big opportunity to select for resistance to this disease in various sheep breeds. OK, so now uh, what to do when you don't have an identified disease or pathogen? So I already told you. You can have a global approach, uh, so focusing on global health and adaptation capacities. And that's what we did in, in SMARTA. For instance, we uh, studied functional longevity in dairy, sheep, and goats. So the longevity traits is a way of um, tackling the global accumulated resilience mechanisms uh, of the animal, including disease resistance, but not only. In general, the trait that is uh, used is the length of productive life. And here we used the time interval between the first lambing or kidding and the culling date. And um, as you know, the culling decision uh, of the breeder is something very um, uh, personal, but is mainly uh, based on milk production. So that's we don't want to analyze the uh, culling strategy of the breeder. So to correct for that, all the culling due to milk production, we correct the trait for the milk level, and we, we get a functional longevity. So that's all the culling reasons, except those linked to, to milk production. And uh, here, um, in the example of the Kios sheep, Sotiria Vuraki, she's in the audience, uh, estimated a heritability of functional longevity in dairy sheep. It was uh, 0.13, so heritable, but moderate heritability. Quite similar to that estimated in alpine dairy goats, 0.11. And uh, furthermore, in dairy goats, um, Marie Turbide, she's in the audience as well, uh, selected on um, on these functional traits and showed that you can, this way, achieve very different survival profiles in the offspring. And in this example, she had uh, more than 10% of difference in culling rate in the high longevity or lo low longevity line. 
some other uh, author focus on survival in uh, young animals or in fetus, and you can do that using the following phenotype, phenotypic da data, for instance, stillbirth, lamp vigor, birth assistance and suckling ability, fetus survival, you can use pregnancy scans, uh, and the lamp survival from birth to a given age. Again, here the most updated uh, estimates of heritability coming from smarter. So the heritability of these traits, stillbirth and lamb survival was very low in Scotti Scottish blackface use. In some Irish uh, breeds, the heritability of lamb survival was much higher. And uh, maybe this uh, one fact is that this lamb survival was uh, considered over a larger period of time. It was almost, I think, the 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 six six months of the of the lump, of the lump. Okay, here I wanted to highlight a very original um, approach to uh, study the survival in fetus, and in fact, it's extracted from the thesis of uh, the PhD of Maxine Ben, ben Braik. He mined uh, genotypic data without having the phenotype to identify mutation linked to embryonic death. He used what we call the reverse genetic screen method. So he looks at only at the genotypes, look for the homozygous haplotypes, and compare them to what is the expected frequency of them. And if the, ex uh, the frequency is much lower, then he, he states that the ones that are missing are dead, because they, they were, were not genotyped. And he did a lot to confirm this, and he was very successful as he found uh, 13 lethal mutations and could even uh, confirm some of these mutations in experimental uh, designs. So uh, there are a few papers from Maxim. The two here are already published. So to finish on that topic, um, adaptation capacity in small ruminants, there has been an increasing interest on studying uh, the management of energetic body reserves especially in extensive outdoor systems, uh, because indeed in these systems, the variation of nutritional intake is large and the exposure to stresses is very large as well. So the um, uh, animal's ability to adapt is put uh, to test. And so this is a, a few illustrations from a study in Roman breed where uh, the authors uh, studied the dynamics of these body reserves uh, using body condition scores over the different periods, uh, mating to early pregnancy, early pregnancy to weaning, weaning to mating. And here you see the mobilization and here the deposi deposition of uh, the body reserves. These traits were heritable and um, what they found even more, it was a, a large QTL on chromosome one for these traits, uh, which is published now and it's probably the leptin receptor gene. We have some data in Smarter as well on uh, Scottish blackface in extensively managed farm hills with very similar results. So we think with that kind of measures, body reserves and the changes in, bo in body condition score, you have proxies to select for adaptation. Okay, so now resilience as a dynamic response to stress. Here I will get, give you only a flavor of this concept in a two or three slides as we will have a whole day tomorrow on, on these uh, aspects. So there's no more or less a consensus that you should define resilience as a dynamic response of a system to a disturbance. So the, um, it's the way an animal or a system goes through a stress and then comes back to its initial state. And the stress, the, the disturbance can be a biotic, biotic stress, so a pathogen, and here we link with the first part of the presentation, or an abiotic uh, stress, so nutritional challenge, emotional stress, and so on. So a way of um, analyzing this is to uh, study it uh, in one di dimension, that's to say with one phenotype, and then uh, you can, here's what Masoud Gaderi Zefre did, he's in the audience as well, he will tell you more about this uh, in two days. Wednesday, yeah. and uh, so he were, was me measuring body weights uh, uh, after infection, and you can see here the target trajectory, normal tra trajectory in uh, red, and with small deviance, these animals are full res fully resilient, 
non-resilient because they deviate and never come back, or here partially resilient as they deviate and then come back to, to the normal situation. You can also uh, um, uh, address that question in a multidimensional uh, approach. And that's a nice paper from Andrea Will, uh, Dolch Wilson. She did a trajectory based on both the viral load and the body maintenance. So that's a, a very nice approach, but I won't tell more about that. Um, what I wanted to highlight also is that in some contexts, the word resilience is used as um, what we will call robustness. That's to say the way to produce, reproduce, uh, be healthy in a wide variety of environments. <coughs> that can be illustrated that way. You can have a performance in a environment without constraints here that would be the um, ordinate at the origin the potential of, pro of um, production and when the environmental degrades the performance decreases and the robustness would be uh, proportional to the inverse of this slope so that we call it river robustness than resilience so to finish on that aspect um, resilience is a dynamic approach of resilience possibly multidimensional, that needs a proper modeling, and you will see that tomorrow and, uh, and Wednesday. Um, it's interesting because it can be applied to half immune traits, but also to classic production traits. Uh, but of course, it, it needs high density records. So applications in Smarter were, were quite n uh, numerous with, on feed efficiency data, cytokine response, and milk metabolites in response to feed restriction. So um, two or three slides to finish, just to share some consideration with you about um, the state where you want to go uh, to the application. So um, to me, there are a few questions that you have to keep uh, addressing when you want to select on genetic resistance and resilience. Are you selecting on the correct traits? Is this true resilience? Do you have a risk of having healthy careers? Is your selection uh, universal? Is it valid for different strains of the same pathogen? Uh, is there a risk of, emergent of uh, emergence of, uh, of resistance um, from the pathogen side? And you, ha you have to check that that's alongside the selection process. Um, another important um, point is as you probably want to have a balanced breeding goals, breeding a program on both efficiency and disease resistance and resilience, you need to know the effect on the other traits. And to address that question, um, the experiments from divergent selections are very uh, useful. And I uh, listed here some experiments, uh, um, divergent selection experiments in uh, dairy, sheep, and goats two uh, selection on mastitis in dairy sheep and goats, one on functional longevity in dairy goats, and two on gastrointestinal parasites using fecal accounts in meat sheep. One is in Uruguay and this one is in France. So what do, do these uh, um, experiments say? Uh, briefly for mastitis, we uh, confirmed that selection on uh, somatic cell count, which, which is in, in direct measure, a predictive measure, you can have favorable response on the infection, the true infection in, on, on the bacterial load in the animals. And this has been confirmed with bacterial information and with experimental infections. What we wanted to check also that is that selecting on mastitis, you have no adverse effect on resistance to gastrointestinal parasites because they are, these are not, not at all the same para, para, um, pathogen and they don't uh, act on the same mechanism of the animal. Functional longevity, as I told you, has a fa favorable impact on length of life. It's also positively linked with resistance to mastitis and uh, has some link with metabolism. For fecal accounts, uh, the Uruguayan uh, uh, publication showed that there was no impact on residual feed intake, feed conversion ratio, dry matter intake, so that's to say feed intake. So they wanted to know if they can select for both resistance to disease and feed efficiency. And um, in the study from Fred Duar on fecal accounts, he showed some kind of cost of the resistance on body weight, and uh, he will tell you about that uh, tomorrow.
last slide before the conclusion. You can also address that question by um, estimating or looking at the genetic correlation between traits. And here I wanted to highlight a meta-analysis of genetic correlations between resilience and efficiency traits in both sheep and goats that has been um, published by Sebastian Mucha in 2022. And I have extracted two figures from this paper. This one is the genetic correlation between uh, fecal accounts, so for gastrointestinal parasites, and body weight. In fact, each line is a study, and you have the genetic correlation estimated in that study. So you can see that the average is very clo is close to zero. There is no, in general, no correlation between body weight and uh, parasitism. Uh, and there is a very, a very, um, a very low number of, of uh, studies that are outside the range uh, that includes zero, so almost no correlation. In my statistics, it's a little bit different. Here you have the same approach, the different studies. Um, having estimated the genetic correlation between mastitis and milk yield in dairy sheep. So it's centered on zero, but you have many with a slight uh, impact, so a, a slight unfavorable relation between milk production and mastitis resistance. When, but overall, all, there was limited evidence of genetic antagonism between resilience and efficiency. This was a, a good thing for balanced, uh, balanced uh, breeding programs. Okay, so now that's my conclusion. Um, I hope I have uh, convinced you that there are many opportunities to select for disease resistance and resilience in small ruminants. Regarding disease resistance, I wanted um, really to highlight the fact that, that you have to pay attention of, to the meaning of the measure you use and to its link with the pathogen and the expression of the disease. Uh, regarding resilience, I think from this we have a uh, um, many opportunities to um, use it on uh, disease traits, but also to reuse uh, high throughput data we already have. Heritability for these traits is generally lower than for production traits, but there is genetic, some genetic variation. And from gen genomic data, we all, all already have a few major genes of uh, resistance, and uh, hopefully in the future we will have more data. And finally, globally, almost, we found almost no trade-off between resilience traits between them and rather few uh, trade-offs with production traits. But of course, some trade-off may exist uh, only in specific population and environments. So you always have to re-estimate this correlation in your given population and environment. So that's it for the first lecture. I hope I was not too long. Uh, Ricardo, fine? Okay, thank you. Thank you.